like to introduce our first speaker, Raj Kapoor. Raj is the Chief Strategy Officer for Lyft, as well as the Head of Business for Lyft's Self-Driving Division. He also serves as a Board Advisor for Class Pass and Adventure Advisor at Mayfield Fund. Prior to Lyft, he was co-founder and CEO of both Snapfish, acquired by HP in 2005, and Fitmob, acquired by ClassPass in 2015, as well as Managing Director at Mayfield Fund. Raj holds a Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering and Robotics from Carnegie Mellon University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Raj. Okay, everyone can hear me? How's everyone doing? Yeah. Awake, alive? Yeah. This is like the coming where Carnegie Mellon takes over Silicon Valley <laughs> because of self-driving and robots. It's finally our time to eclipse Stanford. Uh, how many people are yeah. yeah. Watch out. It's the Stanford of Pittsburgh. Um, so how many people here work in self-driving? Oh my god, there's like nothing I have to say. You guys are going to know more than me. It's going to be really boring for you. No, I'm not going to get into the technical details because you all will outshine me. Um, but what I will do is give you some context about why and where the future is going. But before I do that, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, the little journey uh, to get here. Because you're all on a journey. Some of you started off fairly new from Carnegie Mellon, 2018. I think two of you in the back there, at least I know. I'm a 1992 fossil. So I've been around for a long, long time. Um, but, you know, it's been quite a journey. I, and he mentioned I've been an entrepreneur. First company I started, totally failed, sold it for 25 cents to the dollar, bought it back, and then it was a good exit to HP. Then I was a VC for seven years. Four out of those seven years, I didn't really know what I was doing. The last three years, I still didn't know what I was doing, but I think I did the right thing, and then I left. Um, and then I started another startup because I'm a glutton for punishment called FitMob, which is the fitness marketplace, which then we ended up realizing that we need to merge with our competitor. And uh, even though she went to MIT, I did it. And, uh, and now it's class pass and it's doing well and blah, blah, blah. Um, but you know, the, the genesis behind all of this was showing up as an, a total nerd. Who here like, was pretty introverted and nerdy when they were growing up before they went to Carnegie Mellon? on this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I was a nerd, and I didn't know much of anything. I went to Carnegie Mellon, I was like, oh my god, there's people that are in art and architecture. It's one of the cool things about Carnegie Mellon. It's like, it's so diverse. And Pittsburgh was like the mecca because I came from Allentown. <laughs> like, Holy shit, this is awesome. I love it here. Um, but what Carnegie Mellon, you know, I came in because I wanted to build rockets, and then I realized Elon Musk doesn't exist. So that's not going to happen. Um, so I ended up going and doing field robotics and mechanical engineering, but really what I fell in love there was entrepreneurship. So um, I became president of the Entrepreneur Club. I started a bartending school because I wanted to find a cheap way to drink, and it did work. It failed. That was my first failure. Um, then I started a student employment agency, understood the power of the marketplace. That was kind of cool. Then I got these job offers, most of which you get are boring, like working in a chemical plant in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So I worked at a phone company, uh, and they said, do you want to do capital budgeting, or do you want to do information services? And this was in 1992. I didn't know what information services was, but I knew that capital budgeting sounded really lame. So I said <laughs> no. And I ended up being lucky to be on the kind of the forefront of what was happening with the internet stuff. And um, Carnegie Mellon was pivotal because I met a professor named Jack Roseman, and he was my entrepreneurship professor. And he really took me out of my engineering skin into the skin of being an entrepreneur. So I credit Carnegie Mellon, not just for the technical education, which I don't remember or use differential equations anymore at all, <laughs> but I credit it for um, the inspiration that I had from other students, the inspiration that I had from my professors like Jack, um, that were amazing. And there's a lot more to the story, um, but I want to talk about this stuff, so I'm not going to go into the detail. If you want, grab me afterwards. Get me a glass of tequila, I don't like beer, and we'll sit down and talk about um, post Carnegie Mellon. The one thing that uh, took away was that I did the entrepreneurship, VC thing, entrepreneurship, and I really felt like I wanted the next thing a sense of purpose. What I feel super passionate about, this is the why for me, and every job that you have, you should think about what your why is. Someone says why, you should be able to answer it in a, in a sentence or two. My why 
is climate change, which is not necessarily related to self-driving cars, but I'll explain why. Um, I think it should be, and I think it will be. But for me, climate change is the biggest issue that our planet is facing. It is the proverbial frog in boiling water. I wanted to do something about it. On a separate tangent, I created a Facebook game that didn't go anywhere around climate change. So I figured I should do something real. And what I saw um, after, I, so when I was a VC, I invested in Lyft in the Series A. And I was, it was called Zimride, and it was a carpool kind of matching service, nothing to what it was today. And, but I really liked it because it brought efficiency to transportation and it brought less cars on the road because we match people that are going long distance. The issue there was long distance didn't matter, it was short distances that really matters, which is why I looked pivoted. But what I see is that um, there are, what I noticed before joining Lyft was that um, there are going to be two and a half million people moving into cities over the next 15 years. There is no way that the existing transportation system that we have will accommodate this growth in cities. And with cities brings the opportunity to have a better efficient use of resources because people are very dense together and you can have new forms of transportation that are there. So I felt like the automobile is broken and we need to figure out a different way. And when I dug into it, transportation is not the number one cause of uh, carbon emissions. So it felt like a great calling to call up my friend Logan and say, hey, Let's go solve this, not because I wanted to join Lyft. I was thinking about doing some crazy VC fund or a new startup. He's like, you're an idiot. Come and join me. So that's what brought me to Lyft. Um, as chief strategy officer, but that's just a brouhaha title. Really what I'm trying to do is to make uh, us have an impact on congestion and most importantly, emissions. And so with that, I'll jump into it. Um, transportation is a really amazing, interesting thing. Most technology takes an extremely long time to disseminate over the years. Now, of course, it's easy. There's networks and, and social networks and blah, blah, blah. But look at this. This was, in 1900, the Easter Day Parade back in New York City. And it's mostly, if you see, notice, those are horse and buggies that are everywhere. And transportation is so vital, so important to everyone that when something is innovative that happens in transportation, it rapidly picks up, even without social networks in those days. So, you can see, though, there's one car that's there in 1900. Fast forward 13 years, which today is like three months. So 13 years, this is what the same city looks like, the same street on Easter Parade, except one horse and buggy <laughs> that made it out there. So never had before has such a rapid transformation occurred, and it happened at an unprecedented scale with the Model T, 15 million produced by 1927. So clearly this is an important invention, the car, the automobile. And people loved it. They could move around a lot faster. And basically for the same cost, you got 6x the speed and range. As being a VC for seven years, one of the things you look for is a step function change, not an incremental change, but a step function disruptive change. This is it, this was the automobile. So happy ending, we're all done, right? Maybe. So the auto industry spends about $44 billion in marketing each year. The average American owns two plus cars. And so people flooded their driveways with cars. Cities were built around cars. The highway system came about. All these things seem good, but we are in a situation now where it's not working. So 76%, this is what drove me to invest in Zimride, which is now lit. 76% of U.S. commuters drive to work alone with a very inefficient use of the four to six seats that are in the vehicle. 14% of a city like L.A. is now parking. And it's so damn expensive to live there. So that also is a head scratcher. And then, of course, you look at what happens. We talk a lot about the fatalities that occur. 94% of accidents are due to human error. Texting, impaired driving. But really, look at the number of people that die from vehicle emissions. This is if you live near a highway so that you uh, contract some sort of disease around the respiratory system. It's greater than the number of accidents that are caused, that are there. And economically, it really doesn't make sense. So the average person is spending about 737 a month. Um, that's about 9,000 plus dollars a year. And it is the second largest expense after housing. So you spend more on transportation as an average American than you do on food. And the kicker is, 
you're utilizing it 4% of the time. So 96% of the time on average, the vehicle is sitting unused. So for an entrepreneur that looked at music and said, I can, do, I can move music to a service, because how often do you use that CD that's sitting there? Movies, same way, all sorts of entertainment. This is staring you in the face saying, look, this has got to change and make something different that happens. So, sorry for the logo, but I really do believe in that we are on a precipice. It's not gonna happen right away, but we are on the verge of the end of car ownership. It really just doesn't make sense. It used to be that people tied their identity, who they are, uh, their, their status in society by the car that they drive. And if you're over the age of 40, you may still do that. But if you're under the age of 25, I would argue you probably don't. And a record number of people are not getting their driver's license uh, that they were before. So we're seeing all the stars that are starting to align. And what I think the opportunity is, is to take this potpourri of services and, and things that you have to buy and put it into a subscription plan, very similar to what you have for your cell phone, very similar to how you consume music today as well. So we think you should consume transportation on a per-use basis. It's a much more efficient use of resources. And it's not just it's a better way, it's the only way because we will not be able to accommodate the two and a half billion people moving into cities over the next 15 years otherwise in doing it. And it's a big opportunity. Why are there literally 100 plus companies, maybe now it's like 85 because they did, some died, uh, pursuing the autonomous space? Because if the market size is one trillion, why shouldn't a bunch of VCs write billion dollar checks? Because if you look at the math, that's what they do for like, you know, a $500 million market, they'll write a $5 million check. So it makes sense to be putting the enormous amount of capital because the opportunity is so big um, that's being faced. And it's not just autonomous, again, I'll, I'll paint a bigger picture. So we think the solution is really a combination of things. And let's think about the city dweller again, not the person living in Palo Alto. The city dweller hopefully has a reasonable public transit system. Unfortunately, this isn't the case in most American cities, but it should change. Um, look at micromobility. How quickly has that grown? I mean, literally, two, three years ago, there's no concept of scooters except razors. And now all of a sudden, you like trip over one when you're walking down the street in every global city, not just in American cities that are there. And that's because the demand for trips. So I think about 60% of trips are typically under two miles or so if you live in a city. So it really makes a lot of sense to engage in micromobility for that reason. Of course, bikes too. We were able to buy the largest bike share in the US. And so we're just rolling out electric bikes. Of course, there's some battery problems, but we'll get over those and uh, we'll get them out there. And then, you know, Lyft, Uber, whatever it is, rideshare driver is a piece of it and the AV is a piece of it. But the entire solution is what's important. So at Lyft, we don't call ourselves a rideshare company anymore. It's about transportation. It's about how does the consumer get there from point A to point B. If they say they want to go somewhere, we're going to point out the fact that they could probably get there cheaper on public transit. They should do it. It may be 12 minutes more than if they got a rideshare driver, or it could be maybe um, 20 minutes more than they got a scooter, depending on the traffic, all sorts of things. So let them make the trade off and come up with it, but there's no reason to own a car. I think the statistics are that in a city like New York, 67% of the population, it makes no economic sense given what they commute and do to own a car. That, now New York is extreme, but that, those economics are now starting to seep into every city that's there. So we're really on to something big. So why does AV matter? Um, AV matters in isolation, I will argue, so autonomous is not enough. And this is where I'm gonna talk most of my argument about, which is that what we need to have is connected, shared, electric, and autonomous. Without this, you have emissions problems. Without shared, you may have more cars if they're cheap enough on the road. That doesn't solve congestion uh, that's there that we have an issue with. And of course, connected so that you can actually have an efficient use of those resources that are there. So I'll go through each of these, but for consumers, there's been some crazy statistics. This is right down the street, Stanford Rethink X, I think is a some sort of think tank, and they said, I mean, I wish this is true, but it's pretty aggressive, that 80% of miles can be served by on-demand electric self-driving fleets. And once that occurs, we see that shift, it's bigger than a Republican tax refund check that comes into every uh, household. 
and I'm not trying to take sides. Um, but transportation could potentially be 10x less expensive in this future, but not just with autonomous. It has to be all of those things that are there. So um, clearly the connected side of things is pretty obvious. It's growing. People like it, so I won't spend much time on that. Shared. So the interesting thing about shared is that uh, we started this, I don't know, like four or five years ago. People said, no, oh, you're never going to share, share a ride with someone. Um, it never, never going to happen. And it was really hard initially because if you don't have density, you don't get the match. And then are people going to really use it? Like they're playing roulette every time they open share. So what we had to do is to charge people the shared price even though we didn't have a match. But that caused this to go up to the point where now 35% of Lyft's rides are uh, shared. So two people that donate each other are going into a car. And we expect that to be 50% over the next few years. It's super important. So as you get more and more people on the network, the network solves the problem of, of having that density and making it so that you don't have to um, uh, necessarily, you can share the ride, you can share the, the, uh, the fee that's there. What we notice also is that when people are paying less, it's about 25 to 30% less, they also have a secondary effect, which is they stop looking at their phone and actually talk to the person that's next to them. And humanity comes back into the equation as well. So that may not be the first reason why people try it, but it becomes a reason why they potentially sustain it too. So I think we're going to move more and more to this shared concept uh, that's there. One other interesting thing here, um, you know, a shared system that drops two people off at exactly the pick up and drop off that they want is actually still inefficient. So what we introduce is this really novel concept called walking. Um, and I don't know if you've pulled up left, you'll see shared saver is an example of that. We say, hey, if you walk, usually less than five minutes to get to the point of pick up or to the drop off, um, you can save even more. Because it's basically, now what have we done? We've created virtual bus stops. This is what the bus system should be, dynamically figuring out where to do pick up and drop offs and having people walk to get there. So it is kind of a form of public transit that we see. And they, that's when you can drive the prices down, especially with autonomous and electric, to close to a bus fare and, and start to get the economics that you need uh, that are really important, by the way. Most of poverty is also linked to uh, transportation deserts where people can't get to jobs in inner cities, as an example. Um, why electric? Well, it's good for the environment. We know that. But why else? Um, some of you know this already that are involved in cars, some of you don't. Uh, it is a significantly higher life because there's much less moving parts in it. Yes, you may have to swap out batteries, but less than 100 moving parts versus 1,000 plus in an ICU vehicle that's there. And the other piece of it is that it's hard, because if you're only utilizing your vehicle 4%, are you going to pay a premium on the front end to buy an electric car? This is why most Americans haven't bought an electric car. We're utilizing our fleets 60 to 70%. In the autonomous world, I think we could drive to 80% utilization of a car. So now all of a sudden, the, the upfront investment is actually not that important to us. We're very less sensitive to that. And we also know exactly as a fleet where to put the charging stations because we know what the, the transportation pattern is. We have all of that data in the city. So we're able to create charging stations that are there. So it's not enough to just say, hey, I've got an autonomous car. I've solved the brain of the car. You need to build charging. You need to build maintenance. You need to build out parking. Because there's going to be a lot of times you look at the peak size of the fleet at 4 a.m., where are those cars going to go? They can't deadhead the streets or just go around the east side of Manhattan waiting for rich people to come out. So you have to find a place to put them somewhere. So, and then lower cost. Um, once you can, the, the cost of operating is, is, is less than half of a, a, a car at scale. And so we think it's a no, this is, forget about the environmental reasons, which is why I came. It's the economic reasons that's going to push this forward. So why AV? It may be obvious, but it takes, it's useful since a lot of you work in self drive Take a step back and say, why does the consumer care? They care, of course, safety is the first thing that people talk about, but it's also reliability. So ETs will be more precise than pre-positioning. The wait times are short because we can tell the robots where to go and where to, we know exactly where the demand is going to be coming. Uh, and affordability, of course, there you can as soon as the you take that make it fully driverless, you can bring the cost of transportation down. And we see that people are very sensitive to that. And then there's a consistent experience, and I'll get into this a little bit. We're not going to think about cars the way we did. We're going to think about cabins. What you're going to care about is not if it's a GM or a Ford. No offense, if you're an OEM. What you're going to care about is what's my cabin like you do when you get on an airplane in doing it. Of course. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, and I think Chris will go 
deep into the autonomy stack and all the hard stuff that's there. Um, but this is a big problem. We're, we've got now 400 people in Palo Alto down the street, Pageville Road, building a full self-driving system. Um, we've got a bunch of cars on the road, doing a bunch of autonomous miles that I can't talk about uh, on a weekly basis. But it involves not just what's in the car, but involves um, a shit ton of stuff in the cloud too, because the system is constantly learning um, that's there. So why do we think we're in a good position to do this? Again, I apologize, it's not really a lip pitch, but let me just say in general, um, for a network to get involved in self-driving, um, I don't think that self-driving is just gonna come out in a few years and you're just gonna go to buy a car at the dealer. Because these vehicles can have a limited ODD that's gonna be increasing over time, as those who are involved in the industry understand this. So the first application of self-driving technology will in fact be rideshare. And think about it like it's going to be, the way I look at it, it's like a mobile network. There's 3G and 4G networks, right? You can't, there wasn't like a new 4G network that disrupted AT&T and Sprint and Verizon because you needed those 3G, you needed that 3G connectivity because the 4G was spotty for a long time. So you needed a phone that could be able to traverse back and forth. Same thing, you're gonna need humans for a very long time. What consumers care about is a three minute wait time. If it's four minutes, five minutes, it sucks. Two minutes, it doesn't make much of a difference. Three minutes is the magic number, is what we found. And to get that three minute wait time consistently over the next decade as we're in this world of hybrid, you need to have drivers too. So um, that's one. Two is that these drivers, like we, we bought a company called Blue Vision Labs in London where they utilize the video to capture scenarios. So these drivers are driving real life, not just on a test track. And we're able to look at all the crazy scenarios that are happening. We're also able to then create a histogram of the frequency of those scenarios and help us answer the question, which is a tough one in self-driving, is how safe is safe enough? Well, if you knew what the frequency, the frequency of scenarios are, you could then say, okay, I'm going to handle 99.998 or 99.91, and then I can rely on the humans uh, to do the other ones and dispatch safely um, in that case. So we think that that hybrid is going to be important. The other thing that's important is to actually tell the consumer what's going on. So we have now done almost 70,000 rides in Las Vegas with our partner Active, self-driving cars, these BMWs. Um, we also are live with our friends Waymo, so we're right here from Waymo, the crowd. And we've learned a couple things. One is when the person comes in, they're like, cool, this is awesome. What the hell is this car doing? So right away they want to know, what's, is the car seeing what I'm seeing? And the second thing they're thinking through the head is the car doing what I would do or at least being better than what I would be as a driver. So you need to give them that situational awareness, which is what we added into uh, the vehicles that are there. So where are we with this? Well, um, we're not at the stage of technological maturity. Not far, we're far from it. This cycle of evolution of the industry is similar in other industries where everything is now vertically integrated. Doesn't mean it's forever going to be that way, but it's the fastest path to get a product to market. And so there is no standards, really, on software. There's no standard map. Everyone has to create their own HD map. There's no standard hardware. And I predict there won't be for a while because until people learn about what are the pieces of the stack that are super critical, it's gonna be hard to figure out what you outsource. Or if they feel like the, cost, the time it takes to integrate is longer than the time it takes to build if I have a lot of resources, which a lot of self-driving companies do, then there's not an incentive to create standards and to create things in components. It will happen, it's just that we're not at that stage. And I think we won't be there for another five plus, 10 plus years um, in doing it, that's my prediction. I, I talked about this key issue of how safe is safe enough. That's a super important question. We have one way of thinking about it, which is through, again, analyzing the scenarios and lift driver sees, but there's lots of ways that you could, you could skin that cap, but no one has come out with a definitive answer. And the government is hoping that Companies like us that you're working for will come out with that answer. So when are we going to go to market? We're live now with safety drivers. When does it really start to scale up? Who knows? If I have to throw a number down, I would say, you know, four years out. But four years feels like the convenient thing to say. It's like it's time people go to college, you know. So there's no like <laughs> magic time. Um, key hurdles. So regulatory. It's not just that the federal laws aren't there. It's that cities think that they should regulate. What states think they should regulate? What mayors think they should regulate? What, like everyone is trying to regulate, and people are not quite clear on who's going to do what. We're hoping that the federal government at least regulates safety, and we don't have to create a different car for every city or every state. That would be a nightmare. 
that's there, but that's still open. Um, unforeseen hurdles, again, a lot of you are involved in this. Um, people don't know what they don't know about scenarios and the complexity of all those scenarios that are there. And then the market, you probably see if you haven't, um, the vast majority of people, unfortunately, are scared. They're not happy and excited about getting into a self-driving car. Now, what we've seen is that we're getting about a 4.97 out of 5 rating when they step into a, a, one of our cars in Las Vegas and self-driving. Uh, they feel really awesome about it, but it's like one of those things, until you try it, it's really scary um, in doing it. So we have a long way to go there. And we have to prove that we have a statistical safety advantage again. Uh, there's lots of ways to skin that cat, we won't go into that. So let's talk about some of the other things. So you have, let's assume you have AVs. Um, I think that there's going to be so many second order effect changes that if you're entrepreneurs, maybe you're working on self-driving systems, but there's so many other opportunities you could be working on as well. So for example, um, this is a, this is idea of creating this example of a mobile office. And if it's autonomous, you can use all the space inside to be collaborating, innovating, etc. with 5G networks. You have high-speed connectivity wherever you are. Why do we have to have office space anymore? Why is there a concept that we have to have a stationary location? Why can't you live your life like an RV, well, well, why can't you work mobile? So you start upending and thinking about basic things like offices um, that there. Of course, everyone talks about, you can get that right now with a driver too, you can carry it to your bar and thing, that's fun. Um, can the retail come to you um, so that you don't have to go to it? Uh, and then do you rethink the interior so there's a lot more spaciousness? And are people going to say on Lyft, I want a 180 degree client reclining, I need 5.1 uh, channel surround sound. Now get me the left in doing it. And it depends on how far you're going, et cetera, that's there. So beyond self-driving, I mentioned that it's a lot more than just the cars. There's charging, cleaning, parking, storage, maintenance, and scale. My prediction is that for the largest networks, we will be the largest parking operators in the country, given the amount of vehicles that we need to have and the off-peak, what they have to do, we have to park them somewhere. Um, but we still won't need as much parking as we have overall because there's too many parking spaces uh, for consumers. Um, will there be self-driving fast lanes, kind of like slot car going 300 miles an hour uh, down there? That, that may be an initial way uh, to entice people to, to drive more safely. Does driving become a leisure activity? If you had a horse, you can take it to a track. So we're not saying driving goes away, maybe just go hang out at the track um, with the other people that are rich and that can have cars um, in doing that. And the second order effects are massive. So insurance premiums go really, really low because 94% of accidents are caused by human error. All of a sudden, those don't exist, especially when the cars start talking to each other. Auto loans, you're not buying cars anymore. Car sales, you're not buying cars anymore. Rentals, we're already disrupting this space. What's the difference between I'm getting a lift on a mileage basis versus I'm getting a lift on a time basis where I can use the lift for three hours? four hours or eight hours. And we've already started to do that. We have consumer car rentals on Lyft now. Um, so I think that that whole business gets upended. Housing, this is a really interesting question. Are people gonna move away from the city? Because it's, the commute is not as costly. Because A, it doesn't cost as much. B, it doesn't cost as much because you can do other things in the vehicle versus just stare at the road. You can sleep, you can eat, you can do work. So I don't know the answer to that one. I hope people move more to cities because that's a better solution for the environment. Parking, we talked about things like service centers. Driver's license. How are we going to identify ourselves? Who cares if you drive anymore? Um, changes for cities. So I actually think transit, especially high-speed rail, is the best way to get people from point A to point B. They have the location. So it has to be a combination. And I think the autonomous will feed into first mile, last mile, which has been a problem of getting people to use transit as well. Um, the LA, LA said, we're going to lose about $150 million in revenue because people are not going to pay parking fees, they're not going to get citations, and it sounds funny, but that's a real problem because it's funding their schools, it's funding emergency services. So we're going to have to change the way that we tax um, transportation because you need to keep things like infrastructure, public roads going. And then we talked about infrastructure. So I think that cities have an opportunity to redesign themselves. They redesigned themselves in the first part of the century around cars. Now we have an opportunity to design cities around people. Thank you.